Hello, everybody. Uh, it's an honor to be here, of course. Um, thank you so much. And uh, the, the reason it's, it's so exciting for me is that, is that the, the, the past few years, um, every argument I've had with, with another roboticist, um, you know, my, my opinion has been perfectly encapsulated today by, by Mori Sensei's design philosophy, which is that we can achieve higher affinity towards robots by deliberately pursuing non-human design. So, um, the, the problem of creating a social robot, I think, can be, uh, can be phrased as, as the problem of creating an illusion of life. Unfortunately, there's a, there's a book of this very title, uh, and it was written by Thomas and Johnson, who were two um, classic uh, d the old, old Disney animators. Um, and anima a good animator is, of course, a master of creating an illusion of life. Uh, they, in this book, uh, set out 12 principles of, of animation, which, in the interest of time, I, I can't get into. I recommend that you uh, read the book, um, or at least look into these principles. But these, these ideas uh, laid the foundation for the, uh, the great leap in animation that occurred in a period of less than nine years. Um, from Steamboat Willie, which was a very flat and, and sort of creepy animation, to Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Disney's first feature-length animated film, which created uh, the, the depth of character that we've come to expect in every Disney or Pixar or Miyazaki film since. Um, and it was, it was those, those principles which allowed uh, this, this leap, leap to happen. Uh, it was the, These principles were, were reviewed and updated by John Lasseter of Pixar, um, in, in this SIGGRAPH paper, which is a, actually a very good summary of those principles, I, I strongly urge everybody working in interactive robotics to read this paper. Um, it's, it's very important and very useful um, because I think robotics is the next tool um, in, in the creation of, of this illusion of life. Um, each, each of these pr the principles, this is uh, slow in and slow out, uh, for example, have a direct applicability in um, how we control robots and how we how we drive motors. Um, but in terms of the uncanny valley, I think the the most important two principles are um, exaggeration and uh, it didn't show it, it went below, but appeal. Um, and and basically, those those two principles are saying: do not try to slavishly imitate a human being. Take what is really important to conveying life and exaggerate it and make it appealing. Um, we at Beatbots uh, create these these sorts of robots. So they're they're very simple, very minimal uh, in in their form. If you're not if you're not familiar with these robots, you can see tons of adorable videos online. Um, I won't show any now, but I encourage you to do so. Uh, and this robot was. Uh, designed by my partner at Miyagi Daigaku, this is Hideki Koshima Sensei, and he uh, specifically shifted from first creating humanoids, like Infanoid here on the left, uh, was doing studies with children, and moved to making much simpler robots like Kipon, um, in order to make these children more comfortable with the robot. So interestingly enough, he was taking something that was already left of the Uncanny Valley, and moved further left and created something lower on the human likeness scale, but created something toward which children had higher affinity. So what's up with that? Um, I propose that, that there are a few reasons why that's a good idea. Um, first is that the form matches the capability. Uh, Keep on is uh, able to express some very simple emotions, if we put some simple computer vision and, and responsive um, behaviors onto it, they are very simple, and the appearance of this robot matches that limited capability. Um, the design of the robot is very approachable, small, soft, and cute, and so of course children are going to be comfortable with it, and it has very few degrees of freedom. Uh, and since there are a few degrees of freedom, it's easy for us as roboticists to figure out how to control them effectively. If we had a robot with 30 degrees of freedom, it's much, much harder uh, to, to, to build a system that can control all those um, degrees of freedom in a, in a convincing way. Um, 
So I, th I uh, have, have this kind of issue with, with the uh, way that we, we are thinking about the Uncanny Valley today. Um, not so much with the idea, but, but with the way we're um, seeing, seeing the lower on the human, li human likeness scale as also less uh, familiar or, or with lower affinity. Um, for example, if we, if we look at, at uh, two, two robots, for example, Keep On and Manoi, uh, supposedly Manoi should, should have higher uh, affinity, affinity um, simply because it's, it looks more like a human being. I deny that that's true. Um, keep on is simply cuter. Uh, you would also, uh, it, would, it, would, it would seem to suggest that um, the LBR from KUKA is, uh, is more attractive or, or you're more comfortable with it than an older you know, KR-150 industrial robot arm because it's more organic or looks more muscular. And I also deny that. I, I actually feel something uncanny about the LBR. Um, and and I, I find the, the older industrial robots perfectly um, attractive. Uh, <laughs> uh, so so I think there's some there's some issues with, with the with the way we're with the way we're thinking about this, um, and and we seem to be very hungry to to achieve robots that sit on one side or the other um, of the uncanny valley, and we tend to sort of. Um, you know, we, we, we don't want to go too far to the left um, because it supposedly will feel less, less affinity um, towards these robots. Um, but, you know, I think we could, we could probably say that, that maybe the graph looks more like this. That, that, that of course, these, even these axes are not really single dimensional. Um, there is a whole lot of stuff going on to the, to the left of the valley. It's a very interesting and complex design space. And there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, and the, the other problem is that there's, there's this wall we're all pushing against as, as researchers and technologists. Um, technology still cre creates a, a barrier uh, to, to what we're able to achieve. And the issue as we, as we make things that look more and more like humans is that expectations are increased. If we see something that looks like a human, we expect it to be able to act like a human. And this wall is preventing us from meeting those expectations. Why are we insisting on creating humanoids when uh, we can barely create a mouseoid? Uh, there's, there's plenty of work that needs to be done um, it, it, on, the, on the other side of, of this graph. And, and I think f what, what's most important is that form, the form matches the expectations that we set up uh, um, for the capabilities of, of a, any given robot. And, and the gap between what a humanoid robot can do and what we expect it to do is a, maybe a bigger problem for humanoid robotics than the uncanny. And, and, and I, I submit that, uh, that it's more important that we, we create a, a matched uh, formal appearance with, with the capabilities that our technology is able to um, achieve. Yeah. Thank you.